Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Kodi. I'm one of the consultants from the Homerton Fertility Center. And this is my friend Sachin Kulkarni, who heads an IVF unit and a fertility unit in Kolhapur in India. And he has done a significant amount of research in polycystic ovaries in India. And one of the discussion today is to have a perspective into how we can improve assessment of the patient, assessment of the ovaries before we aim to have a tailor-made treatment for patients. And Sachin, what is your view about it? I think uh, rather than coming down and panning down the protocol immediately to any client of uh, polycystic ovary for, or for ovulation induction or ovarian stimulation, uh, we need to be very clear about our objectives. Are we planning on ovulation induction or ovarian stimulation? And before that, is also an assessment about what is a prediction of the ovarian response in this particular lady. So the markers of ovarian reserve need to be studied in much detail and to understand basically which client is a little difficult client for ovulation induction, which one is going to be a simple client. So in, in your setup, when a patient walks in, and I am putting together the setup that happens in the subcontinent, is a patient walks in with polycystic ovaries, uh, what makes you decide that this stimulation is going to be easy or this stimulation is going to be difficult? Yeah, uh, basically it would start with the age and body mass index, but yeah. I would, since it's a polycystic ovary, I would give a lot of importance to the AMH level, the antral follicle count, and the, uh, the extent of hirsutism, whether it is biochemical or uh, hyperandrogenism or uh, clinical hirsutism. Uh, severe the hirsutism, a uh, higher the AMH, denser the follicle and the denser the stroma of the ovary and high BMI and this is going to make a little difficult situation for my client to go through ovulation induction. So it's better I know this first so I can when I discuss the ovulation induction protocol with the client though I'm starting probably with letters or let's say I would counsel her enough that well you are a difficult case and these are the difficulties and can we optimize these difficulties before starting the ovulation induction and that would that would be a better way of going through the ovulation induction rather than just panning down a prescription. Uh, in my practice I tend to uh, do exactly the same. I tend to look at the AMH level and yeah. what the AMH conveys to us. I look at the antral follicle count. I look at the ovarian volume. I think yeah. all these three yeah. convey very specific message and I have akin to calling the uh, the pull of the AMH on follicles as the pull of the balloons. You know, it's balloons which are follicles which get pulled down. And the higher the AMH, the higher is more, the severe is the pull on the follicles. And in my practice, as I have just spoken, I use either the stair step protocol of clomiphene or letrozole, or I use extended. Now, ha what is your experience of prolonging the use of clomiphene and prolonging the use of uh, letrozole. Do you use it in your practice? Uh, not much in my practice, I would say, prolonging the use of letrozole or clomiphene. But yes, stair step protocol with clomiphene, or uh, one who has started with letrozole and then going on to clomiphene on a stair step method, I may, might have used only for economic reasons, the ones. But I would like to go on to gonadotrophin as early as possible so as to have a better pregnancy rate in that particular lady. Uh, in our setup, we often do not combine. Uh, clomiphene or letrozole. Uh, this this is just maybe letrozole. one or two cases which I remember could have been done. But I do agree we should not mix apples and oranges but and we will stick to clomiphene or letrozole. But I believe in India it is very common. I think it's an economical driven uh, practice. It. It's, it's much of an economical driven practice though there is no good scientific evidence to do something like this. So it's entirely economic driven. And what is the protocol when you use a mixture of drugs? I wouldn't say that. I don't use mixture so commonly. But generally, it is the clomiphene which is started with 50 or 100 milligrams. Uh, we see the patient on day 10 or day 11. There's no recruitment of follicle scene. And again, you reinstart the clomiphene for another five doses. That's the way which is the stair step is commonly practiced. Another way I feel a stair step can also be practiced, and there is one paper on that, that we typically don't see a response to clomiphene. Then we go for a withdrawal bleed with primolute or giving some progesterone withdrawal, and then start gonadotrophin in the next cycle. By that, your time to pregnancy is delayed. There's one paper which says that instead of waiting for the period, if you start a stair step, stair step with the gonadotrophin, then on day nine, uh, still you can decrease the time to pregnancy and the response will be same. Uh, the, the other question I think, uh, uh, the, my final question is, 
going to be a far more challenging question. And in your practice, you've been one of those few researchers in the world who has has ex done extensive research on lean PCO. And I don't think anybody in the world has that data which you have on lean PCO. Uh, my concern is it's twofold. One is, does metformin work in these women who have a lean PCO, who have irregular periods, demonstrating uh, insulin resistance? Does metformin work? Ah, very interesting. I think I think we need to individualize the patient. We really uh, uh, need to look into all aspects of diagnosis of PCOS when it comes to uh, any any client. I would say. There are some women who develop PCOS as they grow in size and they start exhibiting a severity of PCOS. Some women are somewhere born with a very high AMH levels and they're the ones that would be lean and have a PCOS therein. Uh, and in these women, though they are lean, they are still insulin resistant. And using metformin, should you use it? Uh, if they have very high AMH from the ovulation induction perspective, I don't know how much difference it would make. but metformin yes from the metabolic parameters they they if they grow in their weight even these lean pieces will worsen their severity so we need to maintain their weight as it is but still help them out with ovulation induction so what dose of metformin do you give for patients with lean pcos if you did if you say you lost all lean pcos with large ovaries high amh irregular cycles all signs that a lean pcos has insulin resistance because you know that yeah. 30 to 40 percent of lean pcos will have insulin yeah. resistance yeah. so what dose of metformin do you start these women on uh, i still start with 500 milligrams once a day for about seven to ten days till the time she's used to the uh, changes in the GI system which take place or the side effects of metformin. And when she's used to that and comfortable about taking one tablet, then I make it 1,000 milligrams a day. But I generally do not exceed 1,000 milligrams a day in my population. And uh, again, uh, one of the things is that Sachin had done an eight-year trial on lean PCOS. Uh, he's one of the only people in India to have shown how diet and uh, the addition of carbohydrate in diets have a negative impact on PCOS, on insulin, as well as on BMI. And I believe that Professor Conway is pub publishing yeah, pub that paper yeah. in the next couple of uh, yeah, months. I, I, yeah, it's, it's, going for the, it's going for the publication. But uh, just to highlight, what I feel is the Indian population has various kinds of diet, and we identified uh, uh, that the women with single carbohydrate diet, like the rice eater community, fares very well. As soon as you have double carbohydrates or addition of junk food to it, you're not only your insulin resistance goes up, but your PCOS starts becoming more and more difficult. I'm also, uh, after this study, I feel, uh, can we add a hypothesis? that can we ease out a PCOS by making her go from a junk food diet to a single carbohydrate diet and taking a reverse way so that uh, she responds better to ovulation induction in the future. Yeah, if you look at the evidence uh, at looking at reversing uh, early diabetes, the, the evidence yeah, is there that, that yeah. if you lose weight, if you cut down carbohydrates, you can reverse the onset of very early diabetes. Yeah. But whether or not you can use it to in ovulation induction is something which is worth trialing out. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, Sachin. I think it's uh, we're having uh, th the next three days of a lot of discussion. And what I enjoy, the, the lot of questions being asked by the students. There's so many questions and their clinical queries and they discuss whatever day-to-day -day problems and troubleshoots they have practiced, yes. uh, faced in the practice. It's so nice to discuss with them and take them I, forward. I think we are again going to meet in February. I think it's 26th onwards. And yeah. again, Sachin Kulkarni gets his experience from India. He brings in his ex huge expertise that comes in from the scenario in the subcontinent, which is very different from what we see sometimes in the United Kingdom and I think this combination is allowing us to uh, give out more information give out more of our experience and which is so important it is our knowledge spreads with exchange of our experiences and that's how you have a collective increase of and, knowledge. and what what I've got a nice feedback from the students is they get a conceptual understanding of the subject rather than just getting the protocols one after the other and that conceptual understanding and which makes them able to design a protocol for their patients and that's very important stuff for the okay. subject. Thank you very much Sachin. Thank you. Thank you.